probably like see my passwords and everything. But Again, everyone online, <laughs> everyone in this room, and this room is get, looks pretty, I mean, we're getting nice and packed in here. Yep. I'm glad to see that. Okay, so fine. There we go. And again, I want to thank everyone in the online chat. Um, <laughs> again, for our friends, if you are online in the, in the Matrix chat, please feel free to share your stories in there. If you don't want me to read it out loud, then please put two asterisks in front of it, and it will just be something for us to read and share. Because obviously there are some stories from uh, the past Perfect. 26 years that uh, might not be as uh, good to put online. Yeah, so, I don't uh, know how much for everyone statues of limitations are up. I know for most of my stories there. That, and <laughs> even then I'm going to score like the names and details for the protect the innocent, the law and order, dun, 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 dun. FYI, because you're speaking, while you're speaking, you can take the mask off. Okay. Also, quick heads up for everyone in the audience. We do have a microphone set up there, and we would really, really appreciate it if you'd come up and speak into that mic when you're sharing your stories. Are we copacetic? Because I have everything. Yeah, let's see. Is it not set to output correctly? OK, finally. Okay. Excellent. Sorry, we'll have Zoom on here. Yeah. We've made it to the end of another day of hope. I want to thank everyone for being with us and for being with us through these uh, lovely technical issues. Yeah. Our final uh, talk for the night. Yeah. The question was, do I remember any hope without technical issues? And I am going to refrain from answering that question on advice of counsel. <laughs> and if you do, how drunk were you? <laughs> or were you only drunk? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, sometimes the best, uh, wrong, wrong spiel. It's like I keep writing these down, and it's very easy for me to lose track of the one that I have. When it opened, let's talk now. When it opened in 1919, it was the largest hotel on earth. And in 2020, we received the cruelest April Fool's joke in its permanent closure. For 24 years and 11 incarnations of hope, it was our place where we found community from the dankness of the sub-basement through the notoriously unreliable elevators to the non-existent rooftop pool, sorry to break the illusion, it was home. Our speaker, Side Pocket and Neo, want to share some of their memories of the place with the memorable phone number, Pennsylvania 6 5000. I feel like taking this mask off is like that scene from Empire Strikes Back with Vader's mask and his little pod. There we go. Oh, God. Now you can see how horrifying I look. Yes. Side pocket unmasked and needs lots of hair repair. Um, hi. Welcome to this uh, very, uh, I guess we're all kind of feeling the same way for those who've encountered the hotel, whether you were at it for hope or for other reasons, which I will get into in a moment where it's sort of like a mix of, you know, it's weird because at the last hope, which thank you, Emmanuel Goldstein, for making that whole naming convention confusing, um, <laughs> but at what was called the last hope, which came after uh, hope number six, because um, we're like Microsoft versions, we don't know how to count. Um, we, uh, we did a mock funeral for the hotel, and because we live in this cursed timeline, Ron Paul arms, it's actually happening. So I'm feeling now the real mix of, especially with my involvement, which I'll get into in a bit, about how much I strangely miss that place, because as Emmanuel has often summed up in the past for that uh, hotel, that it was a dump, but it was our dump. 
And that's how I felt like that. So thank you for talking. I also just want to let you know, as much as it's going to drive uh, Neo crazy just through the interest of time, this part's, by the way, going to be really quick. I'm going to open the Zoom when I'm done with this portion so that way he can join in, yell at me, and then start rambling on Cranky Kong style with his stories. Uh, so it's going to be fun because I get to introduce him. So this will be great. So let's go. If I can. Technology. In here. So first up is Neo. Uh, he's going to have a talk uh, tomorrow, I believe it's, is it at 4 p.m., I believe? Yeah. At 4 p.m., I uh, can't remember which room, unfortunately, um, about um, working in um, accessibility for uh, uh, processing uh, books from text to audio. Uh, he's most notorious for speaking three times at Hope about accessibility called Accessibility, damn it. Um, he's also a longtime Hope alumni, um, and by long time, I think we went to Hope around the same time, which just as a warning, I started at actually the last Hope. I was technically there for the last hour or so of Hope number six, because I actually found out the con was happening right when it was closing. So they just let me wander in for free and no one knew who I was at the time, because no one cared. Uh, but we've known each other. We met 2,600 meetings in New York. We've been around for many years, and I'm happy to call Neo as like also a longtime friend. We're also both involved in what was called the Safe Hotel Pen organization, back to which I will cover about initially when Vernado tried to take the hotel down for really dumb reasons. Uh, he's also a known digital archivist and a uh, huge Animaniacs fan, so Fabu. Fabu. Uh, is he haunting us? Yes. <laughs> awesome. I know. From the Udo Swear. Speak. Yeah. See? It's so, like so the hotel talking. is here. <laughs> hotel Pennsylvania. Everything's half fast and um, nothing new there. <laughs> so, about me, which Neil could probably have a long rant about, um, I've been around New York City 2600 for multiple years. Uh, wearing the same shirt that now has way more holes in it. Uh, I also run a, a group that I'm not supposed to talk about, which is I run a DEF CON group out in Jersey City, New Jersey, so I'm from that hellhole. I've mm -hmm. uh, been involved with multiple groups over the years, including the Yes Men, uh, Tool, uh, the Radio Statler that used to be there, which I have a lot of, a lot of fun, fond, and horrifying memories of the con just doing the radio alone, and the Museum of Urban Reclaimed Spaces, if you ever want to check that out in New York. Uh, I'm also not just apparently a hacker in person. I played one on TV. If you like the show Mr. Robot, and he was like, he'll never shut up about this, uh, I do have a blink a couple times and you miss it cameo in uh, Mr. Robot season three, the opener. Uh, that's a whole different story for a different talk that maybe will come oh, on in the future. Four seconds and he'll never let you forget about yes, it. Yes, exactly. That's the, yep, it's like my sex life. You never forget about it, it's four seconds. <laughs> I also want to say that, um, because we live in this hellhole, uh, fuck SCOTUS, and I know this is a really long URL, but I can also share it in a bit in the future. Um, just as a personal thing, in my organization, up until we've been, li I've been live streaming at Hope, and all the way up until the end of August, uh, so we'll cover that other con too with this, but we are trying to raise money uh, for the National Abortion Federation. Uh, they're a group that works both legally uh, and in person to help medical doctors for safe and free abortions. They've been working with the ACLU and other people to tackle the legal side. They basically cover that whole arena. Um, there's also many other um, organizations you can donate to, including, if I remember correctly, the um, local abortion donation fund, which if you are not, if you don't want to do a big organization, you're not from around here, you don't know, uh, they will donate to whatever your local uh, organization is. So with that, that out of the way, uh, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, uh, by the way, real quick, who's, is this their, who's, this is their first hope? That's a, that's because that's what I was expecting for this talk is for old bees to just ramble on like myself and for new people it was like I heard there was this old place someone got like an STD from a bed bug there I don't know what happened so I want to know where first off it wasn't a bed bug it was from the Segway and second <laughs> off uh, he was served by EMTs on the very last hope which is the really really last hope at the hotel pen and uh, we don't talk about that in public anymore uh, the statute <laughs> of limitations has not quite finished. If you ever got, by the way, if you ever got STD from Steve Rembrandt, round of applause. <laughs> One person, see, they cleaned up, go check that out. Um, and who's this, for first, who's this their first time in New York City? Awesome. Really impressive. Here, I have applause for them. 
So for all of you people who are new here, uh, if this video act, no, it's, if it actually plays, um, even though we're in like almost the end of the con, uh, I'd like to introduce you to our great city in the most New Yorker way possible, if this plays. With a middle finger, I hope? Or maybe it doesn't play? Hmm. Well, I'll welcome you. Welcome to New York. No. <laughs> actually, uh, I really want to play this video. Hang on. I told you to test ahead of time, but does the man listen to me? Hopefully this won't make everyone deaf. Oh, the... <laughs> Mic is off. Let's do it. All the... It's going to do that as a great corner. Up to 11, just like hope. <laughs> we'll talk about that con in a moment. <laughs> do, 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 do. This is like one or two videos. And it won't play the audio. Technology! Redirect the output over the HDMI port. I'll, no, I'll do it later. We'll do it at the end. I want to get rid of it. Just I fill in the blanks. Hmm? Oh, let me guess. There's an audio jack. What is this mysterious technology? Sure. Plug it in, plug it in. There's very few slides for this. I just thought everything would work, which is hacker folly number one, is that you trust the demo gods. And also a round of applause for our volunteer staff, especially for the AV and info desk. They've been, every year at the con, it's been, uh, probably most of their horror stories come from that. Oh, well, we could tell stories about the disinfo desk, but yeah. we're talking about the building. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about the building in a moment here. Uh, in the slide. meantime, I'll do my Red Dwarf impersonations. Hey, dudes, what's up? <laughs> So welcome to this cursed place. Um, we went through two of these questions. I just want to do the uh, demographic. Um, uh, quick shout outs here before we get into the Mia stuff. Uh, which, whose, hope was their, whose hope was their actual first hope in 1994? Anyone in the room? Don't be, don't be shy, old. I got that. I knew it would be you, Cheshire. You've been, I'm convinced you're like. Cheshire's as old as the hotel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I was actually originally introduced to you, Neo, and one of the reasons I brought you on board is that I need at least one other person who was roughly around the same age as the hotel itself, so thank you for being here. I remember what we got the building permits for. It. Yes. Um, it was, uh, what was Shouts, any of the first Pope's names? Last Hope? Beyond Hope. Beyond Hope. Back when we were at the fuck, I mean Puck building, right? I still, that's why I wish Emmanuel would show up, because I still want to know two questions of one, why they chose Hotel Penn. I don't know if anyone can answer that, if they're, you're an oldie here, and two, what happened with that one weird year where we went over to a building that p people barely remember. <laughs> one price, and then it was unavailable that year. Ah, yeah. so this is the I'm dog show convention dog again. Meeting, yeah. <laughs> no, they used to hold the dog show convention. Then we're going to get into like all the times this has been like, on film and stuff like that. So just as I wanted to re quickly recap, trust me, we're going to get in the meeting of this, is that this talk is going to be really short. Uh, the talk part is going to be the beginning and overview of the Hotel Pennsylvania. Then we're going to get right into my own and Neo's own retrospective on uh, Hackers on Planet Earth and our involvement. And then we're opening up to everyone and we're going to tell random stories and we're basically going to be here until they're sick and tired of us and kick us out. So I literally told them when they said this. Five minutes, that, folks. Yep. That we can that just agents steal us and put us near the end and we're just going to keep going on until no one likes me anymore. Uh, stuff that that by the way the agent steals so that that room was always interesting because he would literally go on to like six or eight in the morning originally it was, he kept going over on his talks and unlike what we did with Steve Rambram they put him at the end so he could go on and going in that room it's like there was like a mist in there and like there was just everyone was in like the same weight in the same suit it was like clones it's just you it felt like you were in a different universe like the 18th floor mm -hmm. of the hotel so what the fuck was uh, Hotel Penn so uh, it was located on uh, 7th Avenue. Uh, if you've ever tried to walk that, that's like one of the slowest, sorry, the fastest light changes. They expect you to cross a street that takes like 14 seconds and two seconds in your New York minute. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's been home for Hackers on Planet Earth since uh, 1994. Uh, not too far away from the other conference that starts with a D and ends with a con. Uh, born around the same time, so it's, I would call it like the silver age of uh, hacker conventions, essentially, because a lot of people don't realize that even before that, there was phone freaking conventions where people wore like domino masks and stuff. We should bring that back, honestly. Both the phone freaking and the domino masks. 
so what what so since the hotel's going to be demolished, what ugly piece of shit are they putting there now? So it's going to be called 15 Pen Plaza. This was originally the Vernado's plan. This was originally Vernado's OG plan from back in the day, which is the giant box of ads. Um, Here it is. Here it is. Here's what it looks like. That's yep. exactly what it is. The text kind of goes across the, the page, but at the end it says you can vomit now. Um, yeah, I don't know. What's so odd about the timing of this, too, is that they want this to be like the upper... It's supposed to be a... First of all, um, funny enough, the the biggest group that's been bitching about this new building is the Empire State Building because uh -huh. they they basically have building envy and they're like, all the new New York buildings are taller than us. Please don't make another one that's like right next to us that is as tall. So they actually... it's. Yep, it's slightly shorter, so it's a piece of them, but they're supposed to rent it out to like a bunch of business owners, but it's like guys between COVID and Eric Adams, like no one lives in New York City anymore, especially in that zone. So like, I just like, good luck with that. I just, whew, there's another, and what's, I don't know what's going on with these like new designs. Everything looks like it's from the new Deus Ex reboot. I just, I don't know. So fun thing about this picture, I don't know if most people seen that, this is, not 100% sure, but allegedly you see all the horse and buggies. The scaffolding to the right of the picture is the beginning, supposedly the foundation of the Hotel Pennsylvania when it was being right built. Right across it is what used to be the Pennsylvania Railroad Station. The whole point of having the Hotel Pennsylvania there was to be a place where you could crash right after you got off the train. So basically they invented the subway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and this is also, speaking of crashing into things in New York. This was before the taxi services and everything. Um, but yeah, eventually when it finally got built, it was opened on January 25th, 1919. At the time, it was the world's largest hotel with 2,200 guest rooms, uh, many that we've stayed at. Um, weird question that I was actually gonna bring up later, but I'm gonna bring up now. So how many of the people who attended the convention went to the roof, even though they were not supposed to? We don't actually, how many people were supposed to be on the roof because they were staff? And now how many people were all on the roof in general? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I always call that broke. Um, what's woke is who's ever been to the basement of the hotel? And the better question is, which one of them? Yes. There's a second one. That's what I was going to bring up. Thank you, Dio. The of, third one. The second one. Yeah, third one. The yep. fourth one. It keeps going on. It's like, it's like Dante's Inferno, literally. <laughs> But what's so bizarre about it, and I wish we had, I tried to find pictures, because there's a picture of mine's coming up later where I was in those, they let me carte blanche travel through the place, and it's literally, it's like its own time book, where the further you go through the basements, you actually go back in time to what the hotel used to be like. So uh, I believe the end of the first basement, they have like the original like pink carpeting and doors and stuff. The second basement had the original bathtubs, which are those, those toe-clawed -clawed, uh, bathtubs that every shitty New York building used to have. Um, and then there's a really cool picture that's gonna be later on that I'm still happy I was able to take that. But yeah, this hotel has been around for a long ass time even before we showed up. Um, it's also been around so long that they, everyone kept trying to reinvent it. Uh, again, the text goes across the page because technology, uh, but it changed multiple names. What were the, was it three or four names, Neo? Uh, it was the Statler. There's the, the New York Penta, which was oh, the last one before right. it came, became Hotel Pen again. Right. Yeah, it's basically, it's in our description thing. It's gone full circle. It has like four different names. And it's like looking at the MIRR, ultimately you're dealing with the Pennsylvania Railroad, so yeah. it all got screwed up somewhere. It, it in the kept, being, kept being pushed around and sold to different companies, and Stardust Hotel Penn did five different name changes and came back to Hotel Penn again, so probably the reason why we called it Circle of Hope, but we'll get to that convention when we get there. Um, lots of strange history at the hotel, even before we showed up. There's a bunch on there. Um, some of the highlights is that uh, Houdini... Uh, kind of like, um, trying to remember, Guy Randy, um, who was kind of his successor in terms of this, magicians often debunk, like act like people who think, try to convince you magic is real. And he did a really famous debunking sort of there. So it was kind of the hacker spirit even before we kind of got there doing similar things. William Faulkner uh, wrote, wrote um, uh, stayed there while writing one of his famous novels. Um, Herbert Hoover, uh, that failure of the president, which now he seems like frickin' um, Caesar by comparison with our current presidents, uh, spoke at the Ohio Society of New York. 
1935, and the um, American Russian Institute presented its first annual award to uh, Franklin uh, D. Roosevelt. Uh, and it, the last couple things, I thought this was like the most weirder stuff. Um, in the 1920s, a famous crime boss nicknamed Johnny Jack Nunez threw a, th a $40,000 party at the Hotel Pennsylvania and allegedly uh, people were uh, bathing in champagne at the hotel, which ne I think if we knew that it was gonna be the last time when we were there at Circle of Hope, I think we, that's what we would have done. And, and the club also. We would have yeah, spent $20,000 oh. $20, also, <laughs> and 2020. $20. We wanna we bathe in luxury, not in like imported yeah. urine, yeah. <laughs> Seltzer and piss. Yeah, I know, right? We'll get into that whole thing in a bit. And the one that got cut off is that um, Fidel Castro actually visited during a political rally there. That's a picture of him at the, you can see the square part where it says Hotel Penn. So yes, we've always been like leftist heathens even before we showed up at the hotel. Uh, it's also been, even though it's cut off in a lot of different um, properties and, and movies, uh, there's a little bit of a debate too of like, what do you consider? Because as, as Neo pointed out, the Hotel Penn with the, what we've now known as the Madison Square Garden area, that whole Penn Station, that's why they're named that, they're supposed to exist as a unit. Again, you're supposed to travel to there and then without going above ground, you would be able to enter in and stay at the hotel. So they both fed off of each other. So there's a lot of films that both featured um, Hotel Penn, the, the station, uh, sorry, uh, Penn Station, as well as Hotel Penn itself um, throughout history, including probably the most, one of the most it's famous more, ones. Uh, side project. reference to Gimbel's. Uh, mm -hmm. you look about Gimbel's in the Miracle of 34th Street, that was a reference to Macy's, but Gimbel's was right behind the Hotel Penn, what is now currently and probably will no longer be the uh, Manhattan Plaza Mall or whatever the hell it's called. Who cared anyway? It was just a shrine to capitalism. But one of the sub levels allowed you to go from the one train, mm -hmm. from LIRR, Amtrak, New Jersey mm -hmm. Transit, straight through the hotel and into Gimbel's so you could shop, stay at the hotel, and then get the hell back home, mm -hmm. preferably before rush hour. And uh, what was I going to get with that? Uh, brain freeze, because crazy times of the day. Um, and try pressing F5 on your brain. Yes. There's uh, also a lot of. Um, shows that don't feature the hotel, like there, there was a studio built in the hotel. I've been there multiple times. They would do shows there, and probably the most famous, infamous, in my opinion, is the, the episodes of the Mari show used to be filmed there. So all the you not the father with break dancing stuff that was at Hotel Pennsylvania, and they also did the dog shows there. Crazy. It was the only hotel that had no problem with dogs. Yeah. That's why they were very popular with the Kennel Club. And that's also why there was the phrasing of, we host a dog show every year, and for some reason, it's the hacker conference that usually ends up smelling by the middle of Saturday. I don't know why. <laughs> so speaking of which, even though one of the images did not load, unfortunately, I'll load it later, is that's a picture of the second, because they left it alone, so it also, that second basement floods the lower basement, so it rot out. That's one of my photos. There's also another photo that I took that I'll bring up later since it didn't properly load, where... Um, the story goes is that when they separated both the Penn Station and the hotel, that they filled the, enti the entire tunnel in concrete. And while that was true, they didn't fill it all the way. And so I'm very proud and honored that I have one of the few remaining photos, this one and another one that went off all the way to the left because I guess we built it in CSS, um, <laughs> that they kept them. They kept part of the tunnel because it has the mosaic mural. If you ever gone to a older, not upkept um, hotel subway station, you often see these mosaics made out in tile that says, you know, Canal Street, and people cover the C, so it spells anal. Um, Guilty. And there's, um, yep. And there's, whoop. <laughs> we've been hacked. <laughs> I love that it was, this is like we're talking about Hotel Penn and I think this is like the entire summary of what it's like to run Hope in the past years all in one panel. So I'm already happy about this as it slowly back. comes back down. Applaud for that dude, you did some of that, that's the equivalent of that hacker magic where you just like control shift S and it's like, what did you hack NASA? I don't know what you did. 
But yeah, um, the mosaic that says to Pennsylvania Station is they still kept that. Now, here's the crazy part about the new building. Their, one of their big plans, which is why it's been taking so long to build the fucking thing, is that they're going to restore that tunnel to the new one, yeah. And this is a problem because they have to use a combination of drilling and explosives to do that. So one of the reasons it takes forever is because every time you set up an explosive there, it bothers all the blocks underground in a 20 block radius, so. And not only that, but it also interferes with yeah. Long Island Railroad, New Jersey Transit, Amtrak, mm -hmm. because that hotel is built on top of mm -hmm. all, the tra all the East yeah. River tunnels. Yep. So you have to take extreme caution for that and also the wiring of the building. I don't think we ever mentioned the fact that it's one of the oldest still in use telephone numbers. Yep. All the wiring for the building went down to the sub, 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 sub basement. Mm -hmm. Hence the uh, famous song, Pennsylvania, um, 65,000. Everybody, can we get a cheer of everybody just singing Pennsylvania, 65,000? Come on. Three, two, one. Pennsylvania, 65,000. And then we get the DMCA strike. <laughs> So, as I said, this would be the first presentation on doing, reviewing stuff from the hotel, so I guess we're going to get into uh, hope memory time. Um, I'm going to try to go through, I'm going to start off with a bit about myself, and I'm going to open up to everyone else. And also, I don't know what, do we have public microphones yeah. out here in this room? Okay, okay, because otherwise I'd be like, stand here and you get to be the presenter, like cardboard cut out of side pocket. Um, this hope is going very well. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the new, that's the other thing, too, that's going to be interesting is that, you know, it's so weird to see this as past history, but one of the reasons why it's called New Hope is we get to make new, positive, horrific memories at our new location and turn out. Um, in fact, one of the nervousness about this panel is that I was worried that there would be staff here from uh, St. John's and them not realizing the bottom line they signed just being like, oh no, we've made a horrible mistake. <laughs> yeah, oh God. Well, th is there a more googly eyes on the crucifix? <laughs> I don't know who did that, but great job. <laughs> the all seeing eye, you know? Um, oh, there's been so much new stuff. I, I, you know, if you're able to physically come out here tomorrow, because I know you got stuck in the Twilight Zone. Uh, you're just gonna. I'll be there come hell or high water or basically hotel pen. Yeah, actually, now mm -hmm. I think about it. By the way, that's a picture of uh, one of the earliest pictures of the what the rooms look like. I believe it's from late 50s, early 60s, I think. I think it Yeah. It's one of the current. It was also weird, is like. There were so many different types of rooms, by the way, there. Like, um, here's a fun random story. This actually happened at The Last Hope was, um, so I have a longtime friend that I'm going to get into later uh, named Murdoch, who couldn't be here, and uh, fellow phone losers of America. And the, the his boyfriend that he was dating at the time, um, turns out Render Man is an actual ordained officiator. So under the Canadian flag, we unofficially, officially married them in their hotel room. And that was like a, I remember, I thought originally that was the largest room. They had like two bedrooms. It was this long hallway. And I'm like, how did you rent out a mansion? And I found out there was rooms that were even bigger than that. That like, you could see the floor dip where they used to have a stove in those rooms and stuff, which I cannot think about like Hotel Pen having this like fire, instant fire in your rooms at any time. Oh boy. All you have to do is go back about uh, three or four months to when they were doing the demolition work on the hotel. Uh, they did actually set up a fire by accident? Yes. Accident. The, the, day, the day the conference was announced, actually. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was us just, you know, being like, your move, dick weasels. <laughs> um, but yeah, officially, The Last Hope was um, my first one. Uh, things that I remember from that was starting off the tradition that uh, a lot of people don't realize that um, a frequent keynote speaker we used to have was Joe Biafria of... Uh, from uh, the band that my brain is dying from the name of. Dead Candies. Why? That, that's how long I've been. Uh, I've been working out in the sun for four hours, among other things. So, fun. Um, and believe it or not, every the room they would usually host him in had really comfortable floors. So while everyone else was enamored by his talk, I would actually be in there, actually catching up on Z's. And I'd like to not because his talk was boring or anything. It was just literally a comfy floor, and I'd sleep there. And I think enough people slept in there that 
I hope that, I guess that maybe inspired the hammock area. Who slept in the hammocks at Hope during the multiple years and survived? Who fell out of a hammock at Hope? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The EMTs on scene. Yep. Um, so f funny story about me with the hammocks, um, and I'll open it up more. The first year, which I, that was the last Hope, if I remember correctly, or was it the next Hope? I think it was trying to think. Yeah, I think it was the last hope that we had the hammocks for the, f no, Next Hope was the first time. See, the naming convention. Um, yes. Well, I always thought that if we ever did like a truly last one, it'd either be called No Hope or Fuck Hope. So be one of those two. Not to like fuck hope the convention, but just like general phrase. But anyway, back to the story. So if you've ever slept in the hammock area, you've noticed that they always put it in like all the way at the other side of the con where no one disturbs you and everything. I'm happy they did that because that's not the way it was the first year. I still want to find who thought this was a great idea, but the first time they had the hammocks, they put it right in front of a giant projection screen area for everyone, which is not a problem because they thought, hey, you'd lay in the hammock, watch stuff, the cons and things. The problem was is that someone had the other brilliant idea that as long as it wasn't like straight up porn or snuff films, you could play any video you want on that screen. So as some staff people remember of me complaining about this, I, after a long Friday and Saturday night, day, Friday night and Saturday day during the daytime at Hope, fell asleep in a hammock, woke up to a documentary I, that exists that I've never seen before in my life called Crackheads Gone Wild. <laughs> So imagine you're waking up from dreamless sleep and you're like, why are there two crackheads giving oral sex to each other and now just went through a traffic cone? What is, because I thought I was like, I'm like, I didn't do any drugs at this con. Like for once, I, did I? Yeah, like I'm like, what am I? I'm like, no, this is actually mate. in front of my face. Mate. Oh man, oh geez. That that was a that was so I'm happy that that's one of the few times I hope that like it's like we learned from our experiences. Um, does anyone uh, have any interesting stories about like them spending just like time at the hotel, like I mean, any I room stories that a statute of limitations or you want to throw people under the bus? Uh, I mean, I could follow up with the phone. I don't care. Uh, it's up to staff. There's one in the back. Follow follow the follow the blaming points. I went to Hope a lot of times. Is the mic on? I went to, yes. I went to Hope a lot of times. It's fantastic. The hotel is obviously a dump. Uh, the rooms are terrible. The basement's amazing. Uh, being led around the basement, apparently the hotel had um, direct current power originally. Mm -hmm. and it also had some device in the basement where you could sign a document and it would electronically sign it in. Chicago like some sort of pen that you could grab and like move it around so if you got one of these basement tours there's just so much amazing shit down there and one of the things that was nice about the hotel is especially for a hacker conference is that it was there was so much space for exploration because the hotel they only used parts of the hotel like it seemed like 50% of the hotel was unused and you would go into the halls and you just find these like deserted like haunted ballrooms and you're just like what the fuck yes. is in here is there ghosts in here literally hotel pen is probably the og liminal space meme <laughs> yeah and you and and and, and i would find these places because you know trying to get to the roof to party on the roof and i could never remember the exact way and somebody would had shown me and i would try to find it and i would go through and i would go to the stairways and hit a dead end and be like, wait, where, you know, go back some other different way. And, and you turn around and you get attacked by Barney the Dinosaur or Jason Scott dresses Barney the Dinosaur. <laughs> I just want to know who it was who chewed through the, the cabling that we put up between the 20th. Oh, uh, the switchblade oh. thing? Yeah, someone cut off the internet between both floors. And yeah, I believe I'm sure they did it in frustration trying to find their way, climbing up the rope in order to get to the roof and then cutting the line behind them like Pizarro or something, you know, making yeah. sure no one else could follow them up. I wouldn't be surprised if like a group of friends like told their friend, their non-technical friend of like, no, if you actually cut open the wire and listen, you can hear the internet. And like, <laughs> that's what happened there. And I think the 
following years after that, it was we got. Per, I think it was we got permission to use a certain wet wall to run the wire down, which caused like more hell for staff members and the knock to set things up because you're like spelunking through this hotel and there's like a mummified body in the wall and you're like get out. <laughs> So that was its own hell, but uh, thank you for that. I also like that the beginning of your, your thing there was like the Yelp review of the hotel. It was like, oh, obviously yeah. a dump. It was awesome for a con, four and a half stars. Would do again. The cheat code to get, get, to get up to the roof was there's a, there's a service elevator, and if you could find the service elevator, then you could easily get to the roof. Speaking but. of the elevators, um, oh. um, oh wait, let me just say one more. Sure. So then, I, so then eventually they said in like 2014, 2016, mm -hmm. don't go to roof no more. And I kind of thought it was like not real serious. And so like went to the roof and we got turned back and then we went up again and we got up to the roof and then eventually security kicked us off and then took the badges away and then mm -hmm. going down to the security the next morning. And I'm trying to like see if I can sneak in. And meanwhile, they're going over the PA saying some assholes who didn't listen and went on the roof. And so the main problem, yeah. I remember one year, and I can't remember which one it was. It was definitely one of the later ones where it wasn't even just random people going to the roof. The problem is that someone would bring a prominent, popular person to the roof, so all of their fan base would follow in. So like it'd be someone like a major person up from the EFF or the keynote, and they'd bring them there, so all of their groupies showed up. And I remember one particular year was horrifying because security, like, the reason why they were being such assholes on the roof of like get off is because I'd be on the ground floor and I would literally see. 20 NYPD officers in full riot gear with like their batons and that like there's like hackers full hunting season and <laughs> and then they get disappointed of like no there's no one up there anymore and they're like oh you know now we have to beat up minorities <laughs> <laughs> and in the meantime not only was the roof a problem but also occasionally some special announcement we've made by a major keynote person who I am not going to mention but I'm just going to say the next time you want to hand out your business card with you know, lock picks in them. <laughs> Let security know ahead of time because I got to tell you, Kevin Mitnick, the whole time I was sitting down there at the front door, I see like hundreds of hackers racing through a glass door. I can't tell who's got the badge on, who doesn't, who has to pay, who doesn't have to pay. All I know is that they're going to break down the building. So um, I, I know J Johannes wants to say something, but right before that, and it's probably going to get the rest of my time, um, I particularly want to call out Neo and uh, Liz and anyone who ever worked at what was called the disinformation booth. Is there anything you would want to share about your stories about running that hellhole? I just got one question. What's going on in the fourth track? What, at DISCON? Any track. We never knew. <laughs> the disinformation desk was set up basically because nobody had any information and uh, people would come up to security. Uh, and I was doing security, I think, my second hope and asking, you know, what's going on? What's going on? Because I was apparently the only sober person in all of security. Well, you were the one with all the coffee, so yeah. I want to just say, uh, anytime I fall asleep during a hope, something awful would happen. Mm -hmm. This is a fact. It was proven the last th two or three years. So I made a habit to not sleep at the Hope Conference. My and people would crash out and they would join the info desk just to get a place to sleep for like nothing. So Radio Statler was usually right across, like diagonally from the disinformation booth. And uh, the two things that I remember particularly from that, and I'll give it up to Johannes, is um, one is my favorite, AK not favorite thing you guys would do, even though it was completely right, is people would ask you guys questions and you would just go, do you, do you see the guy with the crazy hair by the, yeah, by the radio? That's side pocket. Ask him. We don't know for some reason, though we're info, he'll know. And I felt like if you've seen South Park, like when they say like token, you're black, you know how to play bass, like they go over and it's like, and I'm like, fuck, I actually know the answer to that too. So you know, my second, my favorite thing, I don't know if you two had a favorite question you guys got, but yeah, my, I have, I agree. my favorite one, I'm going to let you say it and then going to go Johannes is the multiple times where, so you have to understand, usually the entrance where security would be is at the bottom of the escalators. You have to go up past them to get into the con and go up the escalators, go into the mezzanine for the first half of the convention. So my favorite would be is that some schmuck would go to the information desk and legit be confused and go, hi, um, yeah, this is my first hope. I just show up this. Where do you go to register to pick up your badge? <laughs> and they'd just be like, and then be on the radio and be like, hi, security of front, front desk. Are you awake? And like, you know, because it's like, how did you get in here? You're supposed to be down there for the. You, you actually walked past security to 
get this yeah. information. And that's not to shit on security because they they often went through like horror like so much horrifying stuff I'd hear that like basically by mid Saturday they were all dead at that front. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, did you want to say your favorite? Oh question? yeah. So um in this one. Oh yeah, I should have already recognized. Let me give Liz the mic. It's also being recorded for our posteriors, so yes. Posteriority. <laughs> Which, I mean, if you want to be the keynote speaker, you can. <laughs> I would go to that talk. That's not even a joke. I would go to that talk. <laughs> um, in 2018, I had someone approach the disinformation desk. And he was asking me about AV for workshops. Uh, for many of you, you... I just got a migraine with you saying that. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, he was running a workshop, and he was allegedly told that there would be AV support. For most of you, you already <laughs> probably know, workshops don't have a, uh, AV. They're not streamed. Don't ask me any more about it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's the best joke you've made. No, no. AV oh. support at home. Right? Right? <laughs> Well, for the workshops, for the workshops. Yes. So this gentleman, and I'm telling him over and over, like I told him three times, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't understand you're running this workshop. We don't have AV. He's demanding AV support. I'm like, listen, well, you know, with all due respect, um, I I've told you your answer. There's nothing more I can say. But if you'd like, you could pay me $5, and I will tell you whatever you want to hear. Be very happy to do so, but I'm not going to lie to you for free. You know, that's a service. You got to pay for that. So you became Black Hat in like five uh, seconds. Of course. Deep Black Hat USA. Uh, yeah. Of absolute, absolute course. That's what I am Wait, deep down. Wait. We know this. You made a yet, yet you, yet you put me in charge of it. Free? What? You, you charged for bullshit? Uh, that, because that's a share? skill. That's a skill, Neo. You, you know me. I, that's that is why an I work art. for profits. Yeah, exactly. Um, but. There was a little bit of a problem because my smart, I was, not only was I info desk um, for 2016 and 2018, I was also a member of the code of conduct team. <laughs> I, I have a little bit, I actually wrote a whole thing that we're, I'm gonna say if my phone stays alive. Um, and the person asking me about AV support for his workshop was actually the head of the code of conduct team. <laughs> And we didn't meet in person at that point. I didn't know what he looked like. So after the train wreck that was 2018, um, Code of Conduct ha held some, apparently I just hit 10,000 steps, cool. Because um, <laughs> um, I'm Italian, I'm talking with my hands. Um, <laughs> Uh, at one of the postmortems for Code of Conduct, because 2018 was a shit show on multiple levels, um, uh, I, I can't name him, uh, but Sergi went off on me in front of a friend who was interested in also joining, and I had to remind him that I told him the answer. I was just charging for the bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, before I ramble a bit on my own stories, Johannes, you've been patiently waiting for... By the way, give it up for Johannes. He has, not only is his talks at Hope every year been amazing, but he is like usually the one of the highlights for our closing ceremonies every year to the point where I can't wait to see what the closing ceremonies are going to be like this year. Oh my. Uh, I, I don't even know where to start because there are so many great memories uh, to like Hotel Pennsylvania and, and Hope in, in, in general. Uh, I mean, there's the one night that I can't remember, which is probably the most interesting. So uh, if you have any information about that, please tell me. If you have uh, any video information, send it to me first. So I have blackmail, then send it to him. But, but I know like <laughs> one reason. 10,000 Bitcoin and I'll tell you what happened. You okay, cool. Now, but a very special moment was when I and Nick Farr, and we both were like um, 20 club mates or something like that. And we both were wearing so you suits. Had cancer. And we were racing with the segways and, and, and on the mezzanine level, yeah? And I cannot believe that we didn't kill ourselves. This is just like in incredibly lucky that for both of us that this did not happen. But uh, really interesting story concerning the hotel rooms is that uh, because I stayed, I think, three or four times at Hotel Pennsylvania, and I think then I changed to some other hotels. And the main reason for that was that I dared to take off my socks one time. Oh. Bad idea. 
And I actually got some interesting growth on my leg uh, <laughs> because of the carpet or something like that. And it nearly bankrupted the Austrian social healthcare system <laughs> because it took three and a half months and a variety of different forms of drugs to get the yeah. fucking growth to stop. I sti they still don't know what it was. It, uh, I can I tell you what I it was. I luckily didn't have to pay for it, <laughs> really. I can but tell you what it was. It was the American capitalism. It was trying to infect your system. Maybe it was that, but I mean, my main concern, uh, so my name is Johannes and I have a problem, uh, is <laughs> that, that if Hotel Pennsylvania is being demolished right now, I'm fearful of that stuff getting into the, <laughs> getting somewhere, so. We should all take measurements there and trying to find out danger. <laughs> so <laughs> danger. You, so stopping right here. If, if you've seen Johannes's um, presentation, oh, sure. yeah, yesterday, real quick, um, he does a lot of both documentaries, interesting movies, and Johannes. I think you found the plot for your next movie. <laughs> for real. I, I thought yeah. the, story the, the fungus of Hotel Pennsylvania. So, Af Aphrodite, I want you to speak because I have a funny story relating to you, but go, what were you going to say? Undoubtedly at this point, there are going to be a bunch of funny stories involving me, but this one, actually I have to thank Johannes for this. Back in 2016, during the closing ceremonies, he had his uh, usual colorful demonstration. And I don't know if anyone else remember this, but he goat seed everyone. Yes. And here's where it gets better. That actually was the first time somebody successfully goat seed me. Mm-hmm. And after that, I like, followed him back to the hotel he was at, I, and I basically said, fuck you, you goat seat me, and gave him a big bottle. <laughs> um, so you weren't there for when Joe Biafra mooned the audience, because when I took one of the naps, I woke up to that. I, I keep waking up to odd sexual deviant behavior. I don't know why. This is why just I me. never slept With the regards to Joe, I think that was the year that he had me go at 4 a.m. to find like uh, duct tape, post-it notes, and some other weird shit that you could only really yeah. con conceivably find at 4 a.m. <laughs> in the middle of Midtown Manhattan. Yep. So um, I'm glad, Johannes, that you brought up the segues, because oh. most people remember um, the mark of the beast that I'm wearing, Circle of Hope, which for some reason is the uh, vaccine check. So I guess that's even more that the Circle of Hope was a disease that you... To sum it up, Circle of Hope was both my third favorite hope and was the worst hope I've ever been. It was like, it was one of those things where it was like 97% of it was literally awesome and the remaining three were just so awful. One is the obvious incident, which we can talk about later, but I keep think, feeling that everyone else forgets the other incident that I was there to witness, which was... I, yeah, which the public details have still not been announced about that. So. Okay. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, not anymore. It doesn't know. Uh, I mean, they're not here, so I don't give a shit. Well, my whole thing is I was gonna share the the thing that um, Aphrodite asked me to do about all that because I'm gonna. Do, I'll just quickly go over because this is the public thing, so I think this is fine to share. Um, basically, um, this is a little behind the scenes thing. I got really bored and worried about the segues after the first two times I saw them at the convention because I'm just like, one, like, let's do something new with them. Let's replace them with something else. And then over in all my fields, eventually, you know, 90s PSA, someone's going to get hurt. And unfortunately, at Circle of Hope, that did happen. So you probably may have heard the story, if not look it up, of the uh, – there was a segue that did have a charge in it and someone who had probably too much pain go bye-bye juice um, – wrote on one and essentially uh, I guess I'll describe what I saw because I literally looked up and I saw it um, I don't know if he hit the brake or it, it tripped on something but he basically flew off at full speed backwards straight into the wall um, to the point where I didn't even notice like blood or anything I just noticed that he had no top of his head it was that, that, yeah, and uh, you know the amazing volunteers and the the people who were trained EMTs at the time ran in, did an amazing job. But I'm gonna share this part, and hopefully, unless uh, security runs over and strangles me, I'm gonna share this part. So I'm horrified. I'm trying to help out when I can, and Aphrodite walks over and she's like, "So you saw? Yeah, I saw the whole thing." And she's like, "So you know what's going to happen next?" And I'm just like, "Final Jeopardy theme playing," and I went. 
Oh yeah, if they're sending ambulances, so that means NYPD, our good friends from the roof, are going to show up. And so they're just like, yeah, um, so it's Saturday night. And to give you a perspective of what Saturday night's like, one year that wasn't that year, working at Radio Statler, my boss had three bottles of Jameson's. He gifted the staff one as a communal one for thank you for all the work, and he double-fisted, pun semi-intended, both Jameson's that entire night. That's how bad it gets with alcohol alone. <laughs> so I'm glad that- That was currently. also the year where we were given more alcohol than we were capable of hiding. I love- In any shape, manner, or form I, from volunteers, from mm -hmm. attendees, from, I think one of the speakers actually gifted alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were running the best speakeasy in town. I love that when, particularly when press would come by, they would look at the crates underneath the boots and they thought that was like extra AV equipment and a cool hat. No, it's just all, all, all stuff to replace blood with. That's all it was. Alcohol slash vice. So AV. Aphrodite comes over, so she's saying, you know, and I realized, oh, that means police are gonna be here. And it's like, yeah. And she's like, I don't wanna stereotype you because background half black and half Polish. And she's like, but people have been, you know, and could you, and I knew what she was saying, and I was like, we're in an emergency, say no more, fam. So I simply walked around the entire mez, and any bottle that was actually closed, I grabbed, hid it away where I was staying at. Anything that was open, even if they just opened it, I just yanked it out, downed it, and got rid of it. Because I'm known as did a- Did that include the Club yeah. Mate, just in case? I, I think that did. That, I did the proper funeral for it, and you, because there's pictures of this, I just couldn't find them uh, anymore as uh, pouring it down the urinals. Oh, I'm so sorry. Because it is, it's, it's like I'm returning it to its natural habitat. <laughs> uh, so yeah, literally, by the time I got to the last one, that's when the NYPD showed up, and again, they looked disappointed because they were hoping to like find someone. It's like, nope, it's all gone. Because the thing is, is that like I'm known to, this is not a brag, it's that I'm known to consume alcohol and no one not realizing that I've consumed tons of alcohol. So I Witness. think- Witness. That's the, that's the Polish in you. Yes. That's why, because I know Aphrodite was like, I didn't want to, because she said, I didn't want to stereotype you because you don't, I'm just, like, we're in a crisis. So of course I'm going to say yes, you know? But yeah, that's my whole thing about it. Is to hide the booze. And then it was funny because I think we got confirmed too that it's like we're not, we're not gonna have the we're probably not gonna have the segues next year. And then 2020 happened. <laughs> so that that was that whole thing. So that's fine. I'm um, gonna open up again. Anyone want to share more stories? Because I can keep rambling about stuff unless yes. Stop it, my colleague from Radio Statler. There's so much stories by Radio Statler. So much. Well, part of the segues was the first year at Radio Statler we were the corner of where you would turn around the Segway track, so we'd be interviewing like Adam Savage and stuff, and just someone, every yeah. 10 minutes, someone would Kool-Aid man their way through the booth. <laughs> it's like, surprise guest, this fucker, say hi, hi. How many fingers am I holding up? Yes. <laughs> um, go on, Zephy. Uh, I, I first, I missed the, the first bit, but was Steel mentioned at all? <laughs> okay, so, so, so he was a very polarizing person, but one of, one of my fondest memories of, of, of Hope was, so there was this guy who, who claimed to be a, a, a former spy, and whether he was or wasn't, it didn't really matter. But he would basically take on any question that anyone would ask during the question and answer period, mm -hmm. no matter how ridiculous it got. And, he, and until they kicked him off stage, he would keep going. Just like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Ig ignore the, the late, late in life craziness. But so what, one of my fondest memories is it's like four o'clock in the morning and everyone in one of the ballrooms is literally like hammered out of their mind. You kind of start him, noticing a common time period yeah. between all the interesting stuff happening. <laughs> uh, asking him the most ridiculous questions. And I just like I remember like standing up there like double fisting and like swaying in front of the microphone. And I'm asking someone who could be my, my dad or my grandfather to like vividly describe what sexual relations are like between spies of different countries. <laughs> and whether he made it up or not, the, the, the answers were incredibly entertaining. And, and he fielded every question that someone brought up until basically a son came up and like, mm -hmm. and like A.V. was like, we, we got to go. We're not, we, we can't survive anymore. It's like even we need sleep, yeah. Um, so we share one of the secrets of hope to start hmm? that, was re that was never revealed until now. <laughs> I actually liked going and watching the Steel Talks, but at 
time I was working security, and we tried really hard to organically convince him to stop talking. <laughs> and that method involved making sure that his water glass and water pitcher were never empty. And it still didn't work. I still remember the one year when we let him go on and on and on. Then the sun comes up. See, at, and at, he's still morning, talking. At least, though, dead serious about Steele, at least he was like self aware that he'd go on, and that's why we scheduled him for that. Um, Steve Rambram, on the other hand, as I like to nickname him as Steve Ramblebram. Um, you know, I get props where it was due. He had the classic sort of hacker talk where you, eh, and then all the four layer agencies ran over and arrested him. So I get like, okay, giving him like three hours. That, but every year, he kept taking up more and more time on Saturday to the point where all I could think about was what amazing ass talks that I would have loved to see got booted off the schedule just so that he can ramble about the same topics he's been doing for the past five cons. <laughs> that was always about interesting. the expansion of the universe, we usually talk He's imploding. <laughs> It's nice to know the knocks the same when quality. It comes to time. You're breaking yes. up. <laughs> so, never mind. Continue. So, what? <laughs> what? Uh, what was the name of this like crazy uh, private investigator guy? Like, was it Ram? Bad. Yes, that, that was, was Ram. Bad. Yeah. Have you been was, paying attention? Oh, Ask him on the left. This is that guy. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to be the sequel panel for this. At the next hope is that guy. Insert is, that is guy. The, is fuck. the guy around? But like, is he, is he still doing shit? Half what? of it would be about me. I don't know. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my. Um, speaking of, uh, yeah. let's actually talk about like keynotes and talks that we actually liked. Um, I even like one of my favorite things about Hope that I'm glad that the hotel. Also, just going back to the hotel. A weird analogy I've realized that we've reached this point now, and I hope I can make this analogy, is that Hotel Penn, even though it's getting demolished, that's a different reason, I feel like has become to hope as the Alexis Park was to DEF CON now, where that was the, we were younger and crazier and we can't believe they let us get away with all the stuff we did. And so we like that it's kind of safer and secure now, but we also just miss being crazy because we have like actual responsibilities now. Growing up sucks. Yes. So just also a shout out to like the, st that's the staff who just like, it was, sometimes I almost felt like it was like odd abuse where we would just be like, um, so yeah, we have, a, we have a keynote speaker. He likes painting with his feces and they'd be like, yes, yes, just here's the number for cleanup. Yes, you know, like the, the, I'm just shocked of what we would get. Cleanup with. because there was one year where someone had volunteered to be the janitor for the three different bathrooms that we had available dressed as a clown. <laughs> and I never found out who I could thank for taking on the dirtiest, dingiest, least enjoyable job in all of Hope uh, and Radio Statler, yeah. So also, if I remember correctly, Neil, I don't know if you started this or one of the people who helped, but the later parts of the con, uh, I'm so glad this got made, was, an, was called the Underground Shower Network, which was yeah. if you did not have a hotel and you needed to shower, there would be people who would offer your rooms where they'd want, well, obviously they wouldn't watch you shower, that costs extra, as Liz says, <laughs> but... <laughs> You could go and take a shower in someone's room and clean it. I'm so glad because... I can tell you how that started. Uh, that actually started because of the hammocks. Yeah. The fact that the hammocks were located in a central area with very poor circulation meant that body odor would continue to increase. Um, you mean reproduce. Nidow and I had a great idea one year of just hosing people down yeah. while wearing hazmat suits so, because it was much easier the, than convincing them to take a shower. So, so the, the underground shower network came from that funk. What, what spook staff was Gonzo and I uh, used to, another friend of mine, used to pitch every cope that we would do a thing where we would find another third party and all three of us would dress in hazmat suits and we would make a, uh, um, a tile drain area of a portion of the mezzanine and basically if someone has too much funk, they could like silently report to us like we're the stink secret police. 
and run over, like grab them with one of those like extendo collar things, drag them over to that, and I think it was like high powered hose for soap, high powered hose through water, and then a giant leaf blower, and then like <laughs> clear them and send them off. So when they said underground shower network, I was like, thank you, because that was our version of making the dirty joke so bad that the let the least horrifying one that we originally wanted to do would go off. So I'm glad that happened instead of the other thing. Um, yes. So I've got I've got messages from with right guard. Mm -hmm. I've messages from a Hope alum friend, and uh, they have asked me to remind you of the coin op dong flowers. I miss those. I miss when we had those art displays. We had them at um, that was at the last Hope itself. I know we keep going. There's other hopes we're going to talk about in a second, but yeah, that's one of the things I remember. I have a picture. Actually, what I can do is. This was 2008, because I vividly remember, I mean, how can you not remember dong flowers everywhere? Um, I have the picture of it. I started drinking early during this talk. <laughs> there you go. Yes, I know, four words that don't seem to go together. Okay, Yeah. I don't know how we can convince St. John's of whatever if we could do this, but I would love to have them back. So. I mean, we're encouraging reproduction, so yes. The, um, the, the fourth beef will multiply. The, the solar-powered dildo art sculptures, uh, full thanks to Derivan for mm. uh, curating the Hope art space in, in its first art incarnation that year. Uh, that Derivan pulled that together and a bunch of other things uh, for Hope that year. There's also this project that I was dragged on to. Oh my god. The AMD project. I remember playing that sports code. So, um, quick background about like the difference. You're, you're naming all these projects I created. <laughs> this is the lexicon. You created. No. You created. We'll talk later. <laughs> See, statute of limitations. Now we know. Get him. No. Um, what I wish I could load is, and you can still find this because it's archived. I. It's not by 2600. There's a separate YouTube channel that Hope staff have forgotten about that has some of the earlier promo videos, and there's still the Open AMD. They made, they made like a trailer for it. Uh, to the point where my good friend, who I really wish could be here, I couldn't make it due to multiple reasons, Rob T. Firefly, was in that saying the amazing line, what is Hope AMD? And I literally screenshotted that, printed it out, brought it to Hope, and I forced him to like autograph it. So like, just in case you become famous, I have the first. But yeah, this was an interesting project. Uh, it was originally for Mez and 18 Floor, and basically the electronic badges that year had an RFID system with a billion different routers. I mean, now we can just use Google Voice and Google Map to track where everyone is, literally. But, um, and you would be able to see as this map where everyone went um, on the last day of the last three hours of the last day of the con when everything actually worked. <laughs> then we get DMZ day. Hello. I also love the H2K hat. We also had some very interesting up and down, up and down, but like badges each each year. Sometimes they were just slate badges, badges, like our, our current one, which I do have to ask, like I do like this design, but what what was it where this badge, every time you try to pee out a urinal, it blocks your dick? <laughs> it's like, you know the new laptops where they have the little like shutter cover for privacy? It's like that's, I have to like move that out of the way go out of incognito to public mode and then go back. Um, Actually, just the question of the audience, how many of you have brought your old Hope badges? Anyone? We should have advertised that shit. Probably the most, one of the most famous ones was, if I remember correctly, it was, I think it was H2, it was either H2K or H2K2, where it was both a SIM card and a mag stripe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was H2K. H2K, yep. There was a uh, smart card with a mag stripe. Mm-hmm. Can we turn the mic on? Or? Oh, I didn't know if that was you. I thought that was another A, B. It's okay. Do, do, do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So the badges, let's see if I can get them right. H2K and, and H2K2 both had a mag stripe car with a barcode, with a, with a chip on. Mm -hmm. smart card chip. The first Hope badges, I think, were just plain stickers. Yeah, yeah that sounds right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At H2K, those were all actually printed 
off of a similar machine to what would be used to have printed old driver's licenses. Um, H2K2 were all professionally printed, and for those who don't who weren't there or don't recall it, there was a color scheme that was based on the then new Homeland Security color coding list. Mm -hmm. Regular attendees were low risk at blue, then it went to press at orange, uh, I forget the, I think it was uh, like volunteers at yellow, security had orange, and then the core team would have red or highest red. Uh, hope number five was the buttons. Mm -hmm. Uh, hope six was the which weird had, armband thing. Which had a big, by the way, the, the buttons had the big thing where everyone had different numbers on there. And the big question was, who is number one? Oh. Oh, yeah. I got those backwards. Five was the, was the, the printed armband and then six was the buttons. I think Leo, are you being strangled? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember the rest of them right now, but it's... But it's uh, I was looking for the old badges, but, but really after right. six, um, I think I remember them. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, I was looking for my old badges because I, out of habit, you know, whenever you show up to these conferences, you bring the old badges and people would ask, oh shit, well, were you there for this one? Were you there for that one? Do you remember the time? And you would remember things about the hotel mm -hmm. through those badges. They were mementos of the time. Uh, one of them, um, I want to thank, I don't know who the hell it was from the EFF who thought it was a great idea to go up to the roof. Like it was DEF CON because that's how I got a complete set of that year's badges when their badges were taken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, Hope 9, by the way, was pretty distinctive. It was a remastered version of the Hackerspace Passport. Mm -hmm. uh, Hope 10 were patches, the kind that you would yeah. Which, put on a backpack. By the way, the Passport one is my favorite badge just because every area and certain people had like stamps, like you would go through different, so it was just a fun Pokemon, like, you tried to complete your, I thought that was a great way to get everyone involved at different levels at the con who would normally not get involved in certain things. Two Easter eggs in that passport were that where you were from was lo listed as 127001. Mm -hmm. And the expiry date was on the day that the epoch, that the 32 bit epoch would end. Um, um, then okay. it, listen, no, I'm trying to remember. Um, then 11 we had, Badges like this that look sort of like what you see behind the scenes. writing this documentation down on the yeah. wiki? From what I understood with the badges for the 11th one was, because I was a bit behind the scenes, we were talking about so much amazing stuff, and then I didn't hear from them for a while, and then I saw that badge, and basically the answer I was told was we ran out of time and gave up, so we just made these. <laughs> anyway. It happens. <laughs> I just want to share a couple of stories real quick that have come in through the Matrix chat. And I sure. want to thank everyone that is here, that is with us virtually as well for taking part in this. Obviously, this is a weird year, and we appreciate the, and we thank you for taking part in this. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the stories here. My first hope, I, this is by uh, CDJ90. My first hope, I stayed in an Airbnb an hour away. First mistake. <laughs> um, enjoyed the conference all day and got back to the Airbnb and realized I had lost the keys to the apartment. I took the train all the way back, arriving at Hope at midnight, and of course it was still hopping. I got to Lost and Found, and I found the Airbnb keys were waiting for me. Thank you to whoever found them. Aww. Aww. Yeah. One of the traditions, by the way, at the, key, the um, ending, um, the closing ceremonies is the security coming by with the haunted cardboard box of things people have lost, which has include multiple IDs, credit cards, glasses, children, just all sorts of stuff. There's one particular memory that I'm not going to share, but... Uh, uh, and now you're... Share <laughs> yeah, one instead. I remember uh, that, and you and I both know that you're not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about that incident at all. We're going to talk about a completely different one where security had gone up for the closing ceremonies. Uh, and I was the last person at security desk. And we had to call security back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> someone who had been ejected. Mm -hmm. You have never seen security come down 18 flights to the mezzanine as pissed off ever. And I think that was also the year that one of them wanted to retire, and he was about to retire when he was called back into service. Yep. Uh, other stories? I'm, I'm still taking a look through the chat. No, that's fine. No that was also, up, I will make a note about security because security really gets the – because, again, security at a hacker convention and then security at Hope with all of the different ideas and 
chemicals going around. Um, trying to think. Oh, so here's a, do you have one or can I tell a quick one here? Tell yours, I've got one queued up. Awesome. Um, so this one, because I don't care about, I guess, how much I dox about myself. Um, I have a funny story of how I actually got promoted at Radio Statler. <laughs> it actually has a real story. So Radio Statler, so there's no, we used to have a pop-up like radio station. We would form it as the mezzanine would develop and uh, with Stoppe and a bunch of other friends. And um, we would, it's basically, if you couldn't be at the con, we were like your ear in the con. And also we would just, since we were on the ground floor, we would get a lot of like breaking news and odd things that you wouldn't hear from the rest of the convention. Um, there's also a, well, actually, now nah, I'll jump into this story and then we'll tell this one because the other one, I think this one's more funny. Uh, so before I got the promotion, I think it was the same year, one of the traditions that we would do on Friday in particular was, and I'd be asleep during this, was play various card games and odd games in the radio. This was oh. the beginning of the drinking. And <laughs> one year, uh, a person who, sh who uh, should not be named after a musical instrument. Um, Thank you. I don't know if we should say his name, but because everyone else has said his name, but I'm just going to. But he's a good friend of mine, and I love him. He's at the con this year. But he was basically um, so much on the pingo Bye Bye Juice that well, as they were just playing the game, we have the audio of this, he just sunk back in his chair and fell out of his chair through the wall, and there was a hole shaped like his body through the wall, oh my God. which is made out of foam to like reflect sound. That oh, wasn't even, yeah. Yep, like literally. That wasn't even the worst part for me, though. So we taped that one up horribly. The second day, one of the people in charge of their radio also got way too drunk and fell through the exact opposite side that the previous guy did, making a new <laughs> hole in the wall. Because <laughs> that was that thing. It ruined put all in, the graffiti on those walls. Put in mind, we already installed, and this is true, a glory hole in the booth. Oh my God. We don't need any more holes in the wall. That was the thing. There was that and people drawing dicks all over the wall, which as I brought up in our panel, m m m the majority of the attendees, we have a lot of amazing um, Fem identifying and they and them hackers, but a lot of them are still cis dudes. And I'm like, do you do you look down at your junk? Do you know what it looks like? Because there was just <laughs> eldritch, like there was things that looked like you fought them in Elden Ring, where you're like, that's a penis. Do you know what it looks like? It makes you start to think, or maybe not. But yeah, it was fun. Uh, what's the Matrix story? Hopefully more wholesome than that. And I'll tell how I got promoted at the radio. I forgot which. Uh, this is from Technophobe. Great name, by the way. I forgot which hope it was. I, if I remember, this is a, was two, 2K2. After the closing event, folk, folks were invited to tear down by picking up as much Cat 6 as they could from the main room as they could carry. Oh, that's how you get their muscles. Several folks didn't seem to know the difference between Ethernet and telephone cable. So a lot of phone <laughs> cables were pulled off of the walls of the hotel. Oh, dear. Well, how else are you going to get them to upgrade their infrastructure? <laughs> we're, we're Verizon. Uh, we're here to do an upgrade sometime between uh, 2 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. And uh... Speaking of, the, speaking of um, the radio, um, when it comes to uh, pulling cables and stuff, and I just forgot where that topic was. There's just so many. I have so many stories. This is probably why I can't remember it, because I should just tell the promotion story thing. Well, while you try to remember, I'll just point out that one of the best parts about Hope and the hotel itself was set up and breakdown. A lot of yes. people come in early, pitch in. Uh, I remember crimping cables for the knock. I remember doing it for Radio Statler, running cables. I remember the one time we had to somehow prevent the smell of frying bacon mm. to get on the foam heads of the microphones because we were going to return them yes. to the place that we not exactly bought them from. And it's run by Orthodox Jews. And that was the same year that we had the cheese show and the booth that was so small that if anybody felt cold- And the welding hour. Under, the welding hour, but that booth was so tiny and cold and illuminated by one red light. Yes. Then we forgot you're supposed to put the red light on the outside of the booth, not have it on the inside so we all look like a bad, like, uh, 
horror fun house on the inside. It was the best excuse to go into the mezzanine and see what was going on. We also had a real door that year at the radio booth, which I think they got rid of because I remember dramatically one time I wasn't invited to a... They forgot to invite me to the video game talk. That was the legit thing, and I actually kicked the door down as like a jet. So all you see in the background is just the door being kicked down and be like, did someone not invite me to the fucking video game panel? And I think that's where like, we're not having a door anymore. Yes, Lex? Um, so people keep mentioning different projects and, and things, and, and it's making me think about them. Yeah. Um, my, my first hope was H2K2, um, and it was amazing. It was... Like, I was in college at the time. It was like doing a year of college in one weekend. Mm -hmm. it, it, like, you learn that much. Both and in learning and insane. in substances, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so I, I, I really enjoyed that, and I came back for the next one. And um, then I moved to New York, and I helped out a lot on the next one. And then when it came around time for what would be the fourth hope that I would attend, I had a lot of ideas because I'm a person who sees systems that aren't working and says, hey, let's fix that. And so um, we didn't have an information desk and people kept asking security for uh, information and security didn't either didn't have the information or didn't want to answer questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, I noticed that you'd go to talks and there are all these people that are listening because they're interested in a subject and there's one person talking and maybe two or three people get to ask questions at the end, but you don't get to connect right. with the other people in the room. And um, then there was this disconnect between the mezzanine level and the 18th, the 18th floor, 18th we had the, floor. All the talks, yeah. And um, so I had all this stuff in my head. And also, also um, the, the big open space with the high ceiling on the mezzanine level kept being used as a, like a concert space. Mm. And the acoustics in there were just awful. And um, so I got involved in helping to plan uh, what was the last hope. Mm -hmm and got on the course staff and, and was involved in, um, so it, at one point there wasn't really a map of the mezzanine, so I, I drew one, mm -hmm. and I inserted some things that included an information desk, which I labeled the disinformation desk, and um, it included Radio Statler, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be that connection to the 18th floor that, that became a completely different thing, um, yep. because at the same time, I had the idea for the attendee metadata system, the mm -hmm. AMD project, mm -hmm. and um, originally it was gonna be like an hour where we'd have like tables and there'd be different colors of string and they'd be associated with different subject matter at the conference and you'd go and you'd pull the, mm -hmm. the strings and you'd like tie them to your badge and you'd walk around and people would then know, oh, that person's interested in lock picking and I can talk to them about lock picking. And everyone was like, how can we make and this ridiculously more complicated than it actually and is? Yeah, so I, I posted <laughs> this onto- the yes version. Yeah, we, we had a forum for a while. Um, Thank you, Aesthetics. And uh, then uh, Pyro, when I proposed the AMD thing, said, well, what about RFID? Mm -hmm. And I. I had to look up RFID, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> and uh, so that seemed like an interesting way of solving the problem. Um, I'm not an engineer, I'm an artist. Um, I understand how technology works, but I have a learning disability where I can't uh, remember strings of information, mm -hmm. um, so I can't program. Um, and so I can't copy information from one yeah. place to another. I will give credit where it's due. I mean, you helped launch a lot of things. You gave birth to a lot of ideas that started becoming hope standards and things that we would yep. build into the conference. So for germination, keep at it because you've yeah. been hacking these ideas for years. I'm glad we finally got the name Pyro out there because he's been yes, in, yeah. in, the, in the attempt to conserve the hotel 
Uh, I mean, I remember one Black Friday just walking up and down Hotel Penn saying, save the Hotel Penn. We had a whole protest, yeah. Absolutely. Remember what happened to Penn Station? And it was, uh, friendships were made that way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of philosophy uh, took place at the disinformation desk when there was a lull hour. People would come up and say, you know, how do I get started in hacking? I said, you just, you know, sit down, tell me your questions. And we would have amazing conversations, especially Hope 10 was just a fantastic back and forth of ideas. Uh, Hope 11, when we held 11 Z's on Hope 11. I have a picture. Oh. It, it, was, it was one of the, really one of the, I think the apex of that whole conference was just sitting down with friends uh, from near, from far, people who you haven't seen in years, you can't remember their damn name, but you recognize their face, and coming together at this one building, which was nothing significant. It was nothing worth saving, you know, on its own. There was no great significance there. But when you add it all up, all the little pebbles added up to one you got gigantic boulder the size of a boulder, and we carry it with us. I think the best way to sum it up right now is also just to like give a round of applause for both Lex and Pyro. Not only Lex for doing a lot of the infrastructure, but again, Pyro for all of his efforts as well as for the whole Saved Hotel Pen, which a lot of the images and stuff that I showed in the short presentation uh, came uh, from those. Uh, so uh, if I can, are you, are you done? Do you have more? Well, I, you, I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, that's fine. That I'm going to just load pictures up while you talk. You know, the, there's a fairly small core staff that does this every time. Um, and because it takes place every two years, um, we have a gap of institutional memory where we forget what we did last time. Um, starting to get better at that, um, there are systems that we've gotten from CCC that, that seem very helpful. Um, but everybody who comes to the conference can also participate in the conference and, and pitch in and you can send ideas. I mean, this is the first time we've had access to this space and if we do it again here, we should have learned something about what to do with this space and what didn't work. And you know, you should send your ideas into the team, maybe not this week because they'll be <laughs> dead on Monday. <laughs> uh, well, they'll be dead on Tuesday because they still have to break down. Um, but yeah, it, it all comes from the community and, and that's a, a really important part of Hope is that, that it's, it's a make your own conference conference. I don't see my coffee pot there. That must have been an early one. It's a super early one, and you can also see Night Owl trying to just be like, don't bother me, I'm just uh, here. So the, yeah, so the, the, the disinfo desk, which they didn't get the name right on the sign. Uh, I tell you, no, it's a disinformation desk. Yeah. They already screwed up the information. Great job, So, so um, we, we were loading in the, the tables when we were setting up um, for the fifth hope uh, for the mezzanine, and um, I had changed the map so that the vendor area took up half of that high ceiling space so that it wasn't big enough to have a concert area <laughs> so the noise level would be down. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Thurman, who had just started going to the 2600 meetings, mm -hmm. walked up to me and said, hey, what can I do? And I handed him the schematic and said, make this look like this. <laughs> and he said, what, me? No grab people. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, Thurman started grabbing people and, and then uh, he got the vendor area set up the way the diagram looked and he said, what else can I do? And I said, well, um, we have an information desk but we don't really, really have anybody running it. And so Thurman started running the information desk and then people started coming toward Thurman and, and it became this snowball thing where now there's a, mm -hmm. kind of a community around the information desk. Um, that's really the spirit of hope right that, there. Is that is the spirit of hope. Either people just randomly are being like, this is bullshit, what I would do, and oh, I can actually do it, okay? Or just <laughs> like, it's like, you, make this pretty, go. So It's a lot of who, me? Mm -hmm. And suddenly you think, yeah. Yeah. As they become part of core done. staff, yeah. Um, so my, my uh, statute of limitations is past hope story. <laughs> <laughs> is that <laughs> shut up FBI the after party is after uh, the show um, I was hanging out with uh, Redacted in Koreatown and um, we are having Korean barbecue and uh, Redacted got a text from uh, Redacted who was hanging out with Redacted 
Uh, and they were um, at Hotel Pennsylvania, which if you know where Koreatown is, it's a block from Hotel Pennsylvania. So we walked over um, and Redacted, who's from uh, Philadelphia, and you may know from Off the Hook, um, was interested in some sort of electrical panel, like a, a decommissioned electrical panel that was supposed to be really like elegant, like 1919 era electrical mm -hmm. panel that was somewhere in the basement that was some sort of control system that's completely decommissioned and cut off, but, but wanted to see it and probably get a picture of it. And so we went down into the bowels of the Hotel Pennsylvania looking for its original power matrix back from when it was really new. Um, and one of the most interesting things that happened to me during when we were doing Save Hotel Penn was that Pyro got uh, digital copies of the original blueprints of the hotel. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the original blueprints of the hotel, it's a rectangular shape above ground. But underground, it's shaped like a ship. Mm -hmm. It has a yeah. point at one end. Um, and it also functions a lot like a ship. In, in that 1920s, 30s era, it was one of those fabulous New York hotels that you see in the old movies. Um, it, it was the Hotel Statler, and if you think of Statler and Waldorf from the Muppets, That's it's because the Statler was almost a twin of the Waldorf Astoria, and, and the Hotel Statler went downhill, and the Waldorf Astoria got sold to the Chinese as you know, condos, but it was a lot more fancy. Um, but they were very connected, um, and they, they had these kind of systems where um, the there were all these restaurants in there, and, and there used to be the Cafe Rouge, which um, is where the Pennsylvania 6 by 1000 song was played by. Yep. Uh, Glenn Miller. Yep. Yeah, Glenn Miller. Um, and um, so back to the story, um, we went down basically into the bowels of the ship and um, redacted from Philadelphia. Um, was not shy about pushing on doors, including doors that felt a little stuck. Yeah. And uh, at one point we went down a ladder because there weren't stairs. Mm -hmm. And um, then at one point we saw a pit and there was water at the bottom, but we couldn't see it because our flashlights wouldn't reach it. And that was weird. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, well, we were using the flashlights on our phones, so they aren't that powerful. But mm. um, So we, we got down there, and there was this one room, and I'm pretty sure, because we weren't looking at the schematic while we were down there, but I'm pretty sure it was like the, the bow of the ship kind of shaped point on the lowest level, because the room went into a point. Yeah, it like shrinks. And, yeah. But it also, the floor went upward. Mm -hmm. And so you walked in, and the room was normal height. But if you went to the other end of the room, it was about three feet high. And that was weird. <laughs> um, it's, and bit, but it's, like it's its own universe down yeah. there, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's and one of the service you know, there, tunnels. There was a hundred years of um, decay on paint in rooms that hadn't been painted since 1919. And that was interesting, just like the... the textures of the walls and everything. Um, and we were using our, our cell phones to see a lot of this stuff because the lights weren't on in a lot of the places we were in. And so we rambled around and rambled around. And um, eventually we got to a door. We went in and it was like a nightclub out of the 80s. <laughs> and there were all these weird color squares on the walls. Um, but it also looked like it hadn't been used in a while, but like as a club, but it also looked like people had been in there fairly recently. And we think maybe the staff had like used it as a hangout. Um, and if you want to know where this room actually was, when you went into the, um, the expo area where, where you go up the escalator to the mezzanine, you pass a little staircase that goes down. 
And what we realized was that the door to that club was that door at the bottom of the stairs that was always locked and we could never see what was inside. So we were actually in there. Um, and then we found another door and we could hear the subway. And uh, then Redacted uh, got very interested in that door and um, opened it, despite it being nailed shut. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a multi-tool was involved. So we followed Redacted out the door and we were in the subway station. Um, and then Redacted, who was coming out last, closed the door very carefully behind us. And the door locked behind us. And then we realized that we're inside. You know how at the end of the night sometimes they close sections of the subway mm -hmm. and there are metal gates? We're inside. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Found the forbidden uh, escape route. <laughs> Then they, they've got the spinning Iron Maiden kind of things that, that they lock so they don't spin. Um, and, Honestly, and with the way the basements <laughs> were, I wish there was more pictures. I wouldn't be surprised to find an actual Iron Maiden down there. Yes. I'm amazed they haven't found corpses down there yet. Yeah. So um, and it, what we realized was that you can actually climb the bars of the Iron Maiden style turnstiles. Um, and so we, we climbed over it in view of like, 40 NYPD cameras, <laughs> and apparently no They're one was watching the cameras because we very quickly exited the subway and, and went to um, the Blarney Rock, which was across the street, and had a beer and just kind of decompressed after what was probably two and a half hours in the deep, deep bowels of Hotel Pennsylvania uh, in places where not only we're not allowed, we really should not have gone. <laughs> so um, I'm going to tell just because that was that was great, like EXO, the, like going down into the that was almost like a choose your own adventure. I feel like of the description of what the basement was like. Um, gonna segue over into two of my stories now. Open up, and they're kind of related on the same subject. One which I get to bring up a picture for. So as I said earlier, um, let's see if I can find this one because I think this is like the best description of the man. Uh, it's my friend Murdoch, um, consensually assaulting. Uh, one of my other mutual friends as kind of a sum up because the whole thing was there was the con and then there was Murdoch's room. <laughs> now this is actually going to be like, there's a lot of stories. I'm not going to just, even without redacting, I'm not going to embarrass stuff. I want to tell my fun story of literally the strangest thing I ever saw in Murdoch's room because it involves kind of the infrastructure of the hotel rooms. So I, it was, he was on the 15th floor at the time and I really needed to pee. And he always offered the room, gave me the keys and stuff. So I'm like, I'm on the 13th floor, I'll just go up to the 15th floor, hope the elevator doesn't plummet and kill me because that was also a risk in the hotel. Sometimes you would go up on an elevator and the, the crazy one, it wasn't, it was like you would go and then it would drop a foot and then you're like, should I just wait till it falls or should I try to exit and it bisects me? You just didn't know. Um, the worst game of elevator action ever. And, um, so I go to the 15th floor, I walk into his room, and he is just like seemingly passed out on the bed, like face up. And I take no mind for it because I'm used to seeing him like that. Don't ask me why. Walking over past him, as soon as I'm right about to go past him, he snaps instantly awake as if possessed, and he goes, don't go in the bathroom. <laughs> and so my brain, because I'm nuts and he's nuts, started to think, what could possibly be in the bathroom that Murdoch, of all people, does not want anyone to see? Dun, dun, dun. And, you know, there, I had all these crazy ideas as because I'm like, now I want to, so I'm going to walk to the bathroom. And believe it or not, it wasn't any of the crazy ideas that I had, but it really, I should have expected it, but it came so out of nowhere that it, it shocked me even more. Like, I was expecting, like, a gay orgy in there or just something, right? But this honestly just shocked me and scared the crap out of me, okay? And it's nothing truly scandalous. Open the door. There are two fully dressed con attendees in the bathroom, kneeling in front of the tub, because I shit you not, they converted the entire tub into a bong. <laughs> this is true. 
they saran wrapped the top of it and they added a bunch of other PCV stuff to the pipes so you could hit like a giant, and when they would do it, the whole tub would vibrate underneath the saran. So imagine me opening the door, and there's two guys, and all you hear, huh? And I just slammed the door, I'm like, no, I'm just gonna shit downstairs. I'll just shit right in the middle of that. I don't, bye, Murdoch, thank you for warning me. So that was just the weirdest thing. And so speaking of drug-related paraphernalia, I'm gonna tell, honestly, the weirdest, best, most awesome hope story, besides all the friends, and there's Nick Farr. Um, collection of uh, friends. I'm so used to not... She's wearing a helmet in that picture. Yes, for once. <laughs> and this is before the stuff with the segments. That was taken what, the year that we told him he was no longer allowed to stand on anything taller than a stick of chewing gum. Yeah, because he, he fell off and he had this giant... For, his propensity for encountering gravity <laughs> unexpectedly is legendary. Yeah, speaking of friends... And institution. Um, yeah, and he had a giant band-aid that's funny. A giant band-aid on the back of his head... Uh, which I, he couldn't stand me, um, Nick Farr couldn't stand me making jokes about, um, uh, was it, yeah, Pulp Fiction all night? Because the, the guy who gives the two hit guys the mission, you only saw the back of his bald head with a Band-Aid, and that's how he was like, can you stop bringing those references up? So anyhow, yeah, back to this story, cause, and then I'm almost done with stories. This is like the big one I could tell. So this was Hope X, if I remember correctly. Yeah, this was Hope X. It was Hope X. Yep. And I decided that, okay, besides drinking, I have never done any of the other stuff that happens at the con. So I decided, and I'm free to tell this, but just note that this was years ago and I have not done this since. That I was like, as long as it's not like a super, but like I'm not going to do anything that people like to do in Florida. Let's put it that way. And as long as you didn't like inject it in you or something, I was like, I'm going to do all the substances. He was and, studying hard for a drug test, so we had to test oh, every yeah. drug. Yep. And two things happened with that. One was that all my other friends in New York pre-gamed me harder than any of the people at Hope. Because I have a bad mix of gamer friends and drag queen friends, and they just gave me stuff where I would honestly want to list them, but I actually can't remember all of them. And then I showed up, and then there was the big thing, which was uh, still a friend of mine, I'm not gonna name him at the time, had the thing I wanted to do at Hope, which is he had a connection for acid. And the problem was, is that he screwed up the doses. So I'm already screwed up from alcohol and a bunch of other things, and he was supposed to give me my beginner thing of 1.3, and instead I got his dose of 2.8. And, I, yeah, I was not there. And, um, and the reason I'm saying this was Stape is he's the only other person at Radio Statler. He's dead asleep. And I'm walking back and forth like what I, I know it's a mess in the booth, but I'm cleaning the booth. It's almost 9 a.m. on Sunday. Why am I cleaning the booth? I, there's, I feel like something's going to happen. I do, and I look up. And here are all the members of the FreeBSD organization. And I almost forgot that I scheduled to interview them at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> so I'm in the booth all by myself. Stop, he's asleep. I didn't want to wake him up because I felt bad because he makes the website and was running around crazy. Like, he deserves to sleep. I'm a big boy. I can attempt to do this. So now imagine answering questions about FreeBSD and FreeSoft, like, like, like coding to the metal level while I'm seeing blue butterflies trying to creep into my side vision and talking heads that aren't there and crap like that. And when the whole thing was done, I set it to music and I'm like, guys, I don't know how that turned out. I'm so sorry, because I had this plan. I did this, 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 and they were like, wait, you were blasted? And I was like, yeah, why? And they were like, we, we did not know until you, t I thought you just didn't, like we thought maybe you lacked coffee, but we didn't. I'm like, I don't drink coffee. It gives me the runs. And we're like, and I listened back, and I was like, oh my god, I sound completely normal, and this just scares me. <laughs> and then he does not belong at a hope conference. One of the boss comes down from Statler. I'm not gonna name just for that. And he, this is hours later. I'm panicking, and he's like, so I, I heard you did the interview with FreeBSD, right? And he's like. I'm gonna go listen to it now. And I'm thinking like I'm in big trouble. And he has the headphones on, he sits there and he listens to all one hour and 20 minutes of it. 
takes the headphones off and he's like, you've been a volunteer for the past couple of things. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, would you like to do all the interviews and help curate the content next year? And I'm like, and that's how I got promoted at Radio Statler. Basically his argument was, if I could be completely blasted and sound completely normal on the radio, mending it myself, yay for that. It is my least proudest, proudest moment at Hope, by far. Any other stories going around? Or? I do have another story from sure. the Matrix chat that uh, looks pretty interesting. Okay. If only the Matrix chat. I'm not kidding when I say we're going to run this until everyone gets tired and I'm a skeleton <laughs> and stuff. Okay. This is from a person with who, whose name is pronounced Elix and whose handle is written in a very cursed way. At H2K2, we made a fake Wi-Fi antenna out of a soda cup, yogurt, and a couple of straws. We plugged an audio jack into the bottom to a laptop running X radar and an X term scrolling hex dump. <laughs> so, some reporter tried to schedule a follow up interview with one of the co creators. We had a whole story about how the bacteria from the yogurt helped it refract the Wi Fi signal. <laughs> I remember an old lady on the street freaking out and yelling that it was a bomb and we had to calm her down. <laughs> Yeah, the pranks at, at Hope Conferences, um, they've always been kind of good. That one I did not know about. I, I want to thank everybody who's online, who's sharing these stories. Because um, H2K2 yeah, so was, was before my time. And it, that is very much the spirit of the Hope kind of folks. It's yep. We're going to goof off. We're going to have fun. It's a family homecoming for a hacker conference that's not as technical as, say, DEF CON or RSA or anything else. We have a hell of a damn good time, and that was our place to hang out. One of the things I like about Hope, which you definitely see the spirit carried over here, is just the sheer variety of inviting stuff that we're all interested of as hackers, but you wouldn't really consider like a hacker or security sort of thing, hence why we had like Adam Savage there. I remember one year, I can't remember his name, but we had the comic creator of, of the Boondocks there, just because we all loved the show, and he had some very interesting social political stuff. So, yes, McGregor. I bring up this image again because one of the other things I like about Hope is that you can, like a lot of other hacker conferences, but especially Hope, you can come here and just be like, I need yellow cake and some shoelaces. <laughs> and someone inevitably is like, I bring the yellow cake every year and no one asked for it. And finally, someone did. I got to include one other thing since we have, we're talking about, you know, what people would bring in. Someone, and I don't know who it was that I, don't remember what they even look like at this point, brought in a plotted out, complete flowchart, DIY, yes, welcome to hope, thing. what's your problem? The mm -hmm. security and I'm, self I'm glad to say that Sorry, it was the security, security self-service self flowchart, flow chart, it, Corey Doctorow even featured it on Boing Boing after the event that he was a keynote. I'm glad to say to everybody in attendance, that copy has been preserved, updated. We have it safe. Nice. So a little bit of history is sticking with us. That's I, something I to look forward to. I need a copy of that for, for tomorrow. That's impossible. <laughs> I'm losing my voice. No, that sounds like the con today of like, can you have the thing yesterday? Yeah, right? <laughs> um, well, no, nobody tell me these things in memoranda. I could have had it for you all weeks ago. That's an example of the roof. Um, fun fact I also want to throw out there about the hotel, um, literally the hotel itself. Um, because, like, so odd thing, don't ask me how I know this. Um, though, exactly. So, the ho so New York hotels, if you ever wonder why they're so obsessed with the whole, you have to have your room key card to access the elevator, it's because they want to curb normal parties as well as very exciting thrusting motion parties. <laughs> and because the Hotel Penn never ever had that system, it became a hotspot destination for both of those type of events. So if you ever had friends that just randomly disappeared during the con, it might have been because of that. And again, don't ask me how I know this. The better question is, why did you never share this information to the people who might want it? <laughs> so, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name names here, but someone who actually also spoke earlier, I'm gonna let you guess who. Um, he uh, that's the only hint you're gonna get is he he um, oh here's an earlier picture of the radio booth that we used to have back when we thought making out of wood was a great idea. <laughs> um, 
he, uh, so years ago, I think this was, I think this actually was H2K, apparently this happened. A major con attendee was trying to organize like an official hope orgy. And it, like, and it, it was a legit thing, and it almost got off the ground. And the thing that apparently prevented it from happening is the knowledge that it's a hacker convention, especially back in the 90s, people were really good at faking all forms of identification, so there was no way they could confirm that no one was not underage there, and that's why they responsibly killed it. Mm -hmm. I think that was the one, one of the few times we've ever been responsible. So there were incidents regarding uh, entertainment after hours that did occasionally overlap into the con. I don't think I want to go any further than that. This is New York. Uh, I'll put I'll share one minor story without naming names. There was one year where I uh, aggressively uh, with consent made out with a now really good friend of mine in the uh, the not the service elevators, but it's like the the service area we went go and they had stairs there. There was like the normal stairs that you can go up through the hotel and then there was the service stairs and elevators. And apparently when I was doing that, I missed out. That was the year where we had, I think that was the first, second year we truly had sponsors, which was a whole big escapade thing about like hope, like why do we have sponsors? Like we're getting crazy. It's gonna turn into DEF CON the next con. No. And, um, and that, that sponsor bought coasters, which was a bad idea because essentially everyone divided into a, two teams and had a giant coaster war between the Mez. So there was like one group at, at large, like 50 plus on one side and 50 plus all the, all the way on the other side and they were trying to hit each other with all the coasters that were handed out. And I think that was the last year we had coasters that year. Throwies. Yes. So I was like mad because I was like, uh, like my, my friend was high, it was cool, but oh, I missed this. Like it was like the one, now I felt like everyone else where it's like, I'm usually the one that's there when like crazy stuff, good or bad happens. And everyone's like, I can't believe I missed that. So that was my version of missing something at the con. Does anyone, have any, other, does anyone have any other stories to tell or are we starting to get pooped out or? Um, I mean, I, it's, it's more like friends story than mine. Microphone, please. Microphone, please. Microphone. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we want to make sure we can content trace <laughs> the, all of the blackmailing. Well, let me make one last attempt to get, to get his butt on Google Duo. And that oh, we're like full in dialing in on this shit. Did you know one year, and I, I think it might have been beyond hope, even though it wasn't at the hotel, um, what, there was a direct phone connection to like, I think Nick was either on the run or in jail or something like that. Yeah. And we no. called through that on an actual dedicated uh, line. Okay, never mind that. Uh, my friend dis disappeared for about an hour, and we have, and when we came back. He's like, "There's a completely empty floor in this hotel." Yes. <laughs> because apparently he got up at the wrong elevator, went through a one-way door without realizing it, and sp proceeded to go on his his own merry little escape room of adventure for the next hour trying to find a way out. It's like the unofficial escape the room that you never wanted to play, yes. Yes, yes. And now we have this gentleman. Okay, well I just remember, I was actually allowed on the roof because I think it was H2K that we had the special event amateur radio station and uh, help set up that in the HF. And then I was a little bit disappointed. You know, should I have gone to Hope or should I have stayed home and tried to work the special event station? And so, well, you got your handheld with you. Yeah, yes, so we're on 440. Tune it to this frequency. And I literally worked the special event station standing like uh, three feet away from the station and worked it and got my QSL card and all that stuff and sort of it was the opposite of the old days of the phone freak where you call yourself around the world with the blue box, setting up connections to, you know, from, from New York to U, the UK and then to go to India and then to go to China and then go across the Pacific and then call yourself to the phone booth next to you and hear the echo as it propagates through all that delay around the world. And that was just a little short comment I had. Awesome. You know, you just made me real, realize that, like, one of the things, because there's been little things I've realized that haven't happened this year, because we've had such a huge gap that's happened at previous hopes. And one of the things that I realized is that ever since it started, I think this is the first year since it started that we there was no social engineering panel. 
Like there was a workshop about social engineering, but there was that was the staple panel by core staff in Emmanuel, and we just didn't have one. This That's week. what I was just about to bring up. Some of the most awesome. memorable things was the social engineering. Um, can't call it a class. The experience that you would have is they would, you know, call two dominoes and let them talk, or you know, just all kinds of little if things. I remember correctly. Side. My favorite social engineering one was the one where they managed to get a hold uh, remotely. They convinced people to connect them to a PA system at a Walmart, and <laughs> mm -hmm. Kmart, yeah. And I think this is the be like like what's the most amount of chaos I've. This is such a classic hacker thing where they patched it and basically someone did the voice and I'm gonna paraphrase here, but it basically were like, attention Kmart customers, we are having a flash special. Everything in aisle eight is now free. <laughs> I repeat, everything, in, uh, and apparently that we had like, act like some viewer of like someone was monitoring the camera so there we saw like every attendee saw dying laughing like everyone trying to bum rush the thing and all the employees going nuts so that was one thing I remember I also remember the time where they called a, a rival hotel that was like five stars or whatever basically to see if they had bed bugs and accidentally confirmed that they did <laughs> as like I like you know it's like USA Hotel Penn has bed bugs and even though we have the best bed bugs all the other because we're in New York it literally was it this year uh, New York is now considered the second dirtiest city in all of America so, right behind Jersey City, right? <laughs> pretty much. Well, the whole state itself is a city. We're just happy that it's New Jersey. Thank God we're not Staten Island. I'm sorry to say. The other uh, thing that comes to mind that will probably stay with me until life is I found out what happens if you catch air on a Segway. <laughs> because my mind thought the wheels would continue to go like a bicycle. Uh, Apparently, when a Segway gets off the ground, the wheels stop. Mm -hmm. And when you hit the ground, they don't go immediately. It's a balancing act. I, you know, I survived, but didn't know that was going to happen. Tony Hawk Pro Segway 2 Hotel Pen Edition. <laughs> and I thought I was the only one who was ever thrown off those things sober. Yep. So uh, I guess we're going to sort of semi. Go, yeah, we're going to like wrap things up, but we're going to still talk because I, I feel because I'm getting tired because I'm old and sad now. Um, go ahead and stop it. And I have a quick thing to say. Yeah, one more. Uh, I, like so with Radio Stellar, what we what we do is like sometimes it'd, I don't know it'd be like seven or eight in the morning and like we would be the only people up and you'd see people walking on the con floor mm -hmm. and you just uh, pull people in, and I, I remember uh, uh, one year, you know it was like like seven or eight in the morning, and uh, we see like a like a, a, a super famous phone freak like if you googled freak in his name it, it would come up, <laughs> and um, we're we're interviewing just about like computers and stuff like. We don't like to talk about their talks, but like about their lives in general. And he gets a phone call and he answers it. And it's someone from an Indian call center saying that he's having, like his computer was hacked and they need to help him fix it. And he was generally concerned that his computer was hacked and entertained this guy on the phone for like 30 minutes while we interviewed him. Yeah, the beginning of the days of Statler, we actually had a phone you could dial in, which was the best, worst mistake. <laughs> For multiple cons. Oh, yeah, we had a, like a whole audit system for yeah. a while. Yeah. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, we would entertain people who were listening from Australia, New mm -hmm. Zealand. Uh, I think we had one person from Japan, one person from an unknown location. Yes. We, we never got reading. Antarctica. Yeah, no, that was and the I, goal, I, was get somewhere from that Antarctica. That was the goal. We never quite achieved it. But it also goes to show what hope was. I mean, even people who were, you know, before COVID, people were remoting in and joining the conference, even if they couldn't be there physically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got every continent. Mm -hmm. Well, except for Antarctica. Yeah. I'm still waiting for like a penguin or something to dial in for that. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details, but I will bring up another factoid. And if we want to do some details, because I'm just concerned about saying stories even without names and then people run over and strangle me. Uh, one of the most interesting things apparently about the con was that allegedly at the first hope, like the actual first one in 1994, they by design basically started the con with no rules to some degree, so that way, every time a rule was made, there was always a horrific story about why that rule was made. <laughs> I think the public one that everyone knows about, because it's been said publicly, I've seen them say it publicly so many times, was first ever rule was no explosives at the con. <laughs> and that was apparently from some asshole, because it's hope, had Roman candles and was throwing them off of the roof, because everything goes to the roof. And it wasn't even just that, one of the candles exploded and cr and either cracked or shattered the window of 
the then girlfriend, now wife of who was the head of security at the time. So that that's basically so instead of just the usual we're going to murder you, that was an extra like it wasn't just you pissed off, you pissed off like the main person who's now going to kick your ass. Um, I also, I don't know if I want to go into details of this, even though I could say it in a very non-detail way. I was not involved in the way you think, but I got to unfortunately witness a very famous rule uh, that was announced at the con, which is that um, all cons, including this one, were not allowed to bring any prostitutes at the con. <laughs> and that has- Oh no, God, I that, need therapy again. That has, I have to ask, yeah. was Tim involved in that? No, from what I understand, oh. no. Um, I guess I'll I guess I'll try to summarize and go into it a little bit about what happened. I, I'll leave the end part up to interpretation, because uh, it's not what you think. It's not that we you know, but uh, hacks plan. Oh, we had another person I remember who I, I dearly miss speaking here is Cable Flame speaking about hacking sex. We've had many of those along with Kit Stubbs and the rest of them. Uh, so it wasn't that we were against sex work or anything. What essentially happened was there was a I believe there were a first time attendee. And they were lonely, so they thought they'd bring a prostitute to the con to have someone there both for that and just personal stuff, which is normally like fine as long as you're not breaking everything like the rest of the staff is breaking everything. We're good. Yeah, and the, that was the problem. The problem was this guy, because we have this thing at hacker cons where a lot of people are coming in from no-name towns where they were like the leadest hacker there and then they go to a con like Hope or DEF CON or B-Sides and get a horrible rude awakening about like how big the knowledge pool is and stuff. So this, this, this bastard thought that he was such an amazing social engineer that he could somehow manipulate the pimp so that he could have the prostitute for free. He couldn't. That is actually one of the two top reasons why I stopped doing security. Yeah. And this is also the like absolute heroics of the security team and the AV staff looks like they're gonna throw dives at me so this might be the last uh, thing. So I guess we're gonna end with a bang here. So I got to witness this across because essentially I saw security like essentially dragging a dude over to essentially being interrogated by security and this poor lady <laughs> who was unfortunately roped into this because as I was informed and I looked outside to see this, the pimp was there with two people who you could tell if you look were part of his group, where by the way they were dressed, we knew they were concealing weapons and he wants his prostitute back and was willing to essentially fight the hotel and con in the worst way possible to do that. And that was the whole scandal thing. So, and I got to witness going, that whole thing going down. They also needed me to talk to some people. And then there was a revelation that I don't want to go into that was a surprise to apparently including the guy who initiated all of this that just made the whole situation even more worse. But the end of the story essentially was that guy never saw again, probably got yeeted into the sun or worse from what I understood. The girl, we managed to um, contact one of her trusted friends and basically someone paid for a train ticket to go to some place to just get away from all of that. And then I was, statute of limitations over on this, I was part of what was called team distraction where we literally Looney Tunes styled the pimp of just like, oh, we don't know, he went that way, I think I saw him, we, and just he just went to a place that was nowhere and we never saw any of them ever again. So. It was the most critical and best use of social engineering ever at a hacker conference, and there are people yeah. alive today thanks to it. Unlike what the other guy thought of. So I guess unless there's any more stories, because there's so much history that unfortunately, and then this is the key here, is that even if we have more stuff to tell right now, um, the hotel is, go is gone, but it's still being demolished, but like we can't access it anymore. Uh, so save the hotel. So save hotel pen. There's still a bunch of stuff on there, which is where I got a lot from from Pyro and the team. There's uh, face. There's uh, stuff on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, Neo's YouTube, which unfortunately I couldn't rip in time. Um, he has videos when the Ver Vernado was having a hearing about whether they should tear it down or not, which is actually one of the few videos because she passed away in 2016. I couldn't make that one, so I had my mom go over and read the whole thing I wrote, which is I lived in Massachusetts for many years, and Plymouth Rock is voted every year as the worst landmark, in the, like the lamest one in the United States. So we're like, why is this fucking thing a landmark if somehow the hotel isn't? 
Um, so there's all videos about that with former staff and everything uh, all there. Um, so there is a small one. They haven't just been really active because for a while, especially now, it's literally kind of just pyro after a while. Right. What I am hoping for, and I'm actually going to, we don't need the audio for this, so I am going to mute this temporarily, is um, I did see that, so before they decided to like just finally tear the whole thing down, um, there was this whole video about how they wanted to like celebrate one of its birthdays, I think it was like its 90th birthday or whatever, and like renovate it and stuff. And one of the things that they made, if I can skip to it, is there was like a little museum area and it would be, I know someone has a door from the original hotel. I don't know how they got it, but it's in their storage unit. But I would like to create like a, maybe we could have a village every year at Hope where it's just like a little, like this sort of thing where it's a chunk of like all the stuff we were able to like save them from the hotel. Cause I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of this is like on eBay or in people's personal collections and stuff like that. So that would be a thing. I would love to see it. And just following up on the videos, if you if you do any search, whether it's DuckDuckGo or Google, for Safe Hotel Pennsylvania Community Board 5, and you look through the videos, you mm -hmm. will find all of those videos and all those hearings. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and the, the key I was going to get to is that we don't have access to the hotel. And again, it was a dump in its later years, but it was our dump. And uh, now, we're, now we're in Queens. I don't know why, but we are. <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm not saying it's the worst. It's we had nowhere else to go. I mean, I know. who else would put up with uh, like thousands of hackers every two years running rampant, yeah. going up to the roof, going down to the sub, sub, sub yeah. basement, I was just, and I'm leaving just the place as well as we found yeah. it. So we're going to be creating new memories here, but basically even the hotel is gone. Well, that's the reason I want to do this panel. The still there. Yeah, there's demoing it and yeah, taking it down from the inside out. Yeah. But, but it's more of that, as sappy as it sounds, our memories of the hotel are, are, live with us. It lives with all the stuff that we said tonight and every person that attend. Well, you, maybe we could organize that later. Um, but the point I want to make is that, like, you know, this is a new hope, so it's a new beginning. So we're kind of creating new memories and that the hotel, for all of us who've attended, all live with us. We just got here, and and it's literally being run by the man man upstairs. Unless we can somehow get the dildo sculptures back, but yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank. Uh, I know there's a ton of people. There's still a bunch of people in here, but thank you for all physically attending here, and thank you for everyone watching on the stream for this sort of retrospective. Thank you for being patient as we were setting really, up at the last minute. It was really hard to make this a funeral, but not a funeral. And I guess the way I'm going to close this out, because I haven't been able to rip this, so this is going to be a fun adventure where I'm probably going to blue screen the computer. But if you were there... Oh, you're not using Edge. Oh, he's using Edge. It's the first thing I saw. I live on the Edge, man. So if I've entered this incorrectly... Now, you think we're going to do the hotel the Pennsylvania 65,000, and if I got here on time, we would do that, but there was a really famous way that The Last Hope ended that I wanted to start the beginning of, so I think it's, this should bring it up. You can thank Johannes for this song that we all dance to, and it's up to you if you want to dance to it, but I am going to play it. So I figured when we had the fake funeral at Hope that this is kind of the, as much as I love Pennsylvania 6 by 1000, I think this is kind of the great way to end it was the original way we ended the last Hope with this strange Eurovision song that Johanna's introduced us to from on our mind. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the con. Enjoy everything on Sunday, including Neo's talk tomorrow at 4 p.m. Thank your fellow staff members. I hope to see you at the closing ceremonies and have a great rest of the time. Let's go start new horrible memories so I can do another retrospective in 10 years. We just did it for the last two hours. All right, I can't say this anymore. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to...